Greetings Guardians, my name is Byfear. So there was a relationship at the centre of the season of the plunder that is important to the underlying themes of the season. That relationship is the one between the spider and the Kel of the House of Light, Mithrax. This might not seem all important, but it helps to really define the differences between how the different factions of the Elixni really perceive their past as well as the possibilities for their future. On the one hand, you have the spider who thinks it's all brutalism and that nothing can really change, and on the other hand you have Mithrax, who despite understanding the brutality of the past, knows that we can turn away and find a new future for ourselves, and he believes that we can build towards something even greater. But philosophical differences aside, I wanted to try and give you all a look at the relationship of Rakis and Misrax, so that you would better understand them as a pair. So in the season, we already discussed a lot of the story behind the early days of Rakis, Civix, and Misrax. They were all brought up in the same time of the Whirlwind and were in their infancy at the time of the discovery of the Sol system. Most crucially though, they were able to benefit from Misrax's mother and her desecration of the body of Nezarek. As I'm sure you all know, one of the relics of Nezarek was passed on to Misrax, who used it to plunder and pillage his way across the system. During this time, both Rakis, also known as the Spider, and his brother Civix, who would one day become the leader of a faction known as the Kel's Scourge, were at his side, essentially acting as his top lieutenants. This, however, would all change at a point when the Spider grew too powerful for his post, or rather, defied Mithrax in that moment. In the cutscene with Mithrax, we can see him openly marooning Elixni forces on an asteroid in the middle of nowhere, while Rakius and Civix stand behind him in shock. As it turns out, this was a fate that befell the Spider as well. We know this thanks to the Castaways shell from this season, the lore tab of which reads as follows. If Misrax and I have one thing in common, Spider rumbled, it's that we keep an eye toward the future. He turned a delicate ghost shell over in his massive claw, admiring its elixni styling. Even when we lived from one raid to the next, stealing from anyone who crossed us, we always dreamed of more. He stared into the middle distance, briefly lost in reverie, including a place we could call home, outside of that filthy catch. As it happened, Misrax eventually granted me a whole planetoid of my own. He chuckled ironically to himself, just not in the way I had hoped. When I was finally picked up, I was no longer a raider wanted throughout the system. He opened his arms wide, palms up. I became Spider, a simple merchant with a bounty to collect. In hindsight, getting marooned on that forsaken rock was the best thing that ever happened to me. He shrugged non-committally. Maybe being stranded in the last city will serve me just as well. Now the other side of the story can be seen from Mithrax's perspective in the fourth entry of the Above All Else lore book. This lore entry reveals the exact reason why the spider was marooned. Take a listen. We discovered a ship full of human usurpers hiding behind one of the moons of a dusty red world they called Mars. Generations of survivors cowering on a derelict colony ship since the great machine failed them. Civix, Rakis, and I led the raiding party that boarded their vessel. The humans were malnourished and pitiful, yet they still tried to fight us. The battle was short and brutal. I watched Rakis rip a usurper's arms out of the sockets and throw them to the floor. He was so strong back then. We all were. Our growing ether shares were intoxicating, as was the bloodlust of unrestricted violence. Rakis was massive, even then. Stronger than all of us. One of the human champions, if they could be called such, challenged Rakis. The rest of us stood by as he tore the human's limbs off, one by one, and then crushed what was left of the champion's head between his hands. The other humans threw down their arms and begged for the lives of those who did not fight. Noble, but foolish. I corralled the survivors into an airlock and sealed them inside. 
Rakis and Civics disagreed with me on how we should handle them. Rakis suggested that they would be more valuable in servitude rather than given to the cold dark. Imagine it, he asked of me. Usurpers wearing the sigil of our house, doing our bidding for us. Civics seemed amused by this notion. Usurpers serving us, he said with delight. We could steal back the great machine's favor by taking from them their identity. Rakis reached for the airlock controls, and I struck his hand away. He looked at me with confusion and attempted again, disrespecting my leadership in front of the others. I knew I had to do something. Without hesitation, I evacuated the airlock into space, killing our captives. The brothers, angered, fought back. I held honor to my aspirations, strength above all. I butchered half the dregs loyal to Rakis and Civics, then turned my blades on the brothers. In spite of their struggle, they ended the battle at my feet, half their followers dead and the others huddled in fear. My mother was fluent in the language of violence, but I was eloquent. I marooned Rakis and Civics on an asteroid for their final punishment, along with their surviving crew, and left them with a knife and my mother's lesson. When your crew questions your leadership, you make examples of them. I returned to our catch, towing the derelict colony ship. When I told my mother what had become of Rakius and Civics, I expected her to approve, but instead I saw something haunted in her eyes. I thought she was ashamed of me, of what I had done, but I was only following her example. I was victorious, and yet, in victory, I felt emptier than in any failure. It was not until much later that I realized the truth. My mother was not ashamed of me. She was ashamed of herself. Much like the creature of his namesake, it turns out that the spider is a survivor. Surviving being marooned in the middle of space on a derelict asteroid is something that should tell us all about the grit that this one Alexni has. One can hardly blame the spider for his tendencies when he survived such a close brush with almost certain death. Having killed off Rakis, the spider clearly became a creature that resented authority that could impede him, but he also specifically hated the idea of Kells. There's an old, odd extract of lore that demonstrates this all fairly well. One of his key fixers, an elixir known as Avrok, arrived in a fashion and with a determination that immediately put him in the spider's good graces. You can see this from the lore of the Defter Kells ship, all the way from back in Forsaken. It reads as follows. Avrok knew Kells. He had never spoken to one, had never even been on the same battlefield as one, but as a twice-docked dreg of the House of Kings, oh, how he knew Kells. Kells were stronger, faster, smarter. In other words, they had better resources, ate better, slept safer, lived longer. They were like guardians in that way. Avrok had had enough of both. He stopped bringing all his salvage to his captain. They didn't notice, and if they did, it's not like they could have cut his ether rations any more without killing him. Nothing left to lose. He built his ship piece by piece in a gully far away from prying eyes. When the Awoken Prince arrived, he knew a distraction when he saw one. While the Kel mocked his newest prisoner, Avrok made his escape. He flew his ship to the tangled shore. Starving and weak, he stood before the one they called the Spider, offered his ship as a sign of his goodwill. Spider rubbed his chin, an alien gesture. What is it called, your ship? Avrok lifted his chin, looked Spider directly in the eyes. Death to Kells. Spider hired him on the spot. The Spider's resentment of authority is all thanks to the events that date back hundreds of years. The fact that the Spider has even been granted access to the last city in the first place is a remarkable show of how much Mithrax has changed. But the spider remembers, and in many ways, he represents that cadre of Elixni that have just about survived and have done nothing else. They've only survived. 
changing only when they need to, resentful of any authority but their own. True pirates in that sense. If there is one pirate still standing by the end of it, oddly enough, it may be the dead man that has walked so far and come to sit in the last city. It may well be Rakis. But that's all from me for now. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, go ahead and leave a like. And of course, if you have any more to let me know about anything to do with Rakis or Mithrax or the story of the Season of the Plunder, let me know down below in the comments section. If you want more Destiny content, go ahead and hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications. But as per usual, know that your viewership is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife. Purodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.